Um, today we're going to talk about Helm and not particularly like an introduction of Helm of, uh, or Helm how to, but instead about some architectural des design decisions in creating this package manager and involving it forward. Um, that pretty much summarizes me, both at work and out, out of work. Uh, my name is Baruch, I'm developer advocate with JFrog, company behind tools like JFrog Artifactory and JFrog X-Ray Artifactory, anybody? Okay, a lot of people, good. We won't talk about Artifactory today, but we will, we are talking about Artifactory and X-Ray and all kind of, of cool stuff in our booth. We also give those awesome t-shirts away, so you definitely should go there, visit us, get the t-shirt, Talk, um, talk with us about uh, Jeffro products. As I mentioned, that's not what we are talking about. Um, so this is me, that's my Twitter account. You should follow me right now. I'm an extremely entertaining guy. If you are not sure, you will have opportunities later down the road, so no pressure. I'm also a cloud native ambassador. Yay! There is another one right here. Um, and so if you have questions about CNCF stuff like Kubernetes and Helm and, and everything else, Ilya will be a better resource for you than myself. I mainly know Helm. Uh, so yeah, um, I prepared a special page for you so you won't need to take pictures of slides, at least a lot of them. And if you go to jeffrey.com slash show notes, you will find the slides there right there. The video I'm recording, I will upload it later today, so we'll have it by tomorrow if you want to share with your colleagues or whatever. All the links about all the stuff that we're going to talk about, including this entire talk formatted as a blog post, it's already there. Um, comments, ratings, and a small thank you, Raffle, for finding this place again. So that's basically the only page you need to take a picture of, the only slide. You also have this link in the bottom of every slide, um, also with obviously my Twitter account, as I mentioned, when you decide you want to follow me, it's right there, very convenient, and the hashtag uh, of this conference, and also the Twitter handle of Helm itself. When you're going to, wow, Helm is so cool, this is what you need to mention. Um, yeah, so let's start with a small poll, so for kind of a calibrate the level. Um, how many of you heard about Helm? All of you heard about Helm, this is what you hear, very good. How many of you played a little bit with Helm? Um, half of you, I would say. Okay, how many of you use Helm for non-production environment and stuff? Okay, the same people that played with it, that's probably the same question, I guess. How many of you use Helm in production? Okay, and how many of you wrote this thing? There is, here we go, this is Rimas. He is with JFrog and he actually wrote Helm. So first of all, he will be my bullshit detector. If I say something wrong, he was like all bullshit on me. And also he is right here now in our booth. It's not down, it's up. Up in our booth through the entire two days. So if you wanna thank him for this amazing thing or ask him questions or express any kind of Anything basically, Rimas uh, will be more than happy to uh, hear you. So with that, let's start with a very brief introduction of Helm. And, and the majority of you know it, so I will go really fast and probably won't like discover anything new for you, but just, you know, just the baseline. So we'll start with how do we deploy anything in Kubernetes without Helm? So we basically copy YAML and then we paste YAML and then we fix indents. And then we repeat, like a lot, right? This is our life with Kubernetes. Um, and this is like a typical Kubernetes resource. It describes whatever you are deploying. And the most annoying part in all this is this part when you actually mention a tag of a Docker container, of a Docker image that you plan to deploy. And that's because you build a new image now you have one one, and then what? Well, you basically have two options. One option is something like that, and uh, I don't like it very much. And the other, other option is what? Huh? 
Well, we can always use latest, right? I mean, what can go wrong? We can always do latest, right? So to solve this problem and many others, there is Helm. And basically, Helm encapsulates packages of Kubernetes deployments. This is what it does. So here is an example. This um, at least used to be our Kubernetes deployments of JFrog X-Ray. Right, microservices, as it should be. We have a bunch of microservices here. And basically, if we want to instruct how to install X-Ray to our customers, we just say, OK, go ahead and provision all those. We have all the YAMLs in our GitHub. Good luck copy-pasting them and fixing indents for each and every one of them. Or we can say, you know what? Just use Helm. We have one chart which encapsulates all those. And it also solves the problem of those changing details inside our uh, Kubernetes deployments by providing a templating engine. So look here, and you will see that actually now this tag, this 1.0, is actually replaced with a template, which can be replaced in the runtime by something you already have in your values doc, and right here you have your tag 1.1, and all you need to do is change it here, or even in runtime. So when you deploy, you can say, I want to deploy version 1.0 and effectively override what it is in the values file. One of the best, one of the greatest advantages of Helm is how simple it is. So what you can see here is the chart. One of, uh, one of the Helm charts, and that's Docker app. That's an example of Docker. And what you can see here in the chart that you have a bunch of templates and all, all, all the Kubernetes YAML files, including the deployment that we spoke about. And then we have the values file right here, and it includes those values that will be replaced in the templates. And metadata, and metadata is our index YAML which describes which charts exist and what each chart is. So this is how simple it is, and it's obviously a great, um, a great virtue of, um, of, of Helm. One of the most important questions is, what is the relationship between charts and images? And what it looks like is, because we have um, templates, we don't need to release a new chart version every time we have a new image version because we have the templates and then it looks like it solves the problem. And then chart versions is not the number of image tags, or are they? We're going to come back to this question later. Um, this is how Helm looks like, at least Helm 2. Uh, it has two parts. It has the Helm client right here and what is called the tiller server, which is a cluster control which sits inside our Kubernetes cluster. That's its second part. And the Helm client is responsible for stuff like local child development, uh, managing the repositories, interacting with tiller server on the other side. Uh, and the server side is responsible for stuff like listening for incoming commands from the client and then combining charts and uh, values and um, any uh, configuration into a release and then installing charts into Kubernetes, tracking the, the changes, uninstalling, upgrading, and this kind of stuff. So the idea behind it goes back to when Kubernetes was young, small, it didn't have RBAC. And uh, this solution of Helm Tiller was created to solve the problem of who has the kube control, who have the kubectl access. Because you might decide that part of the team that actually needs to provision new resources into Kubernetes, we don't want to give them complete uh, control over the cluster, and giving them access to Tiller server was kind of an RBAC. Well, you don't have a complete Kubernetes control, but you can deploy stuff using, uh, using Helm. Obviously, since then, uh, Kubernetes have um, RBAC, and RBAC, I did mention, stands for 
Oh, role-based authentication control. Authorization control? Access. Access control, here we go, both of them. Um, thank you, right? And, and that, of course, solves the problem of who has it, because we can define roles, and that means that we don't really need all the, this server part at all, and we are going to get to that um, as well. Now, um, basic commands, the most important commands, init um, establishes this connection to the tiller, uh, search, searches for, uh, for Helm charts in the uh, Helm repository, install, actually installs the chart from repository into your Kubernetes cluster, status shows you what is installed and what's not, and repo is, um, is a command to work with repositories. And let's talk about repositories for a second. So there is an official repository, kubeapps.com, uh, and that's actually a web UI over a, a Helm a, a Git repository that has the listing of the charts. The charts themselves are, by the way, on S3, if I remember correctly. They are listed in GitHub, and kubeapps.com is just a nice UI. Uh, that's a very outdated, it's not even close to this number now, but you know, the benefits of having your product starting with A, all you need to do is take a screenshot of the first page. Very convenient. Um, anyway, you go there for search or you use Helm search for search. Um, and uh, you can and you should get a local one. There are a number of options like chart museum and, and what's not. Uh, but you actually even simpler create your own. As I mentioned, the simplicity of Helm here is your friend. All you need to do is run an HTTP server that exposes this YAML, um, index.yaml file and have the zip files right in the root of your HTTP server. That will work. And then every time you have any changes, you deploy new charts, you just run repo, Helm repo index to generate a new index and start saving that, which is a nice way to get started and play with it, but obviously not scalable or not enterprise ready in any way. The other option is obviously using JFrog Artifactory or others like um, Chart Museum that I mentioned. And then you get a truly Kubernetes registry that supports Helm, containers, and everything which is inside your Helm charts or your Docker images with, uh, you know, RBAC and enterprise features, HA and what's not. Come to the booth, we will show you this cool stuff. So that was kind of an introduction to Helm. Couple of words about Helm 3. Helm 3 is in active development now and um, it's supposed to be released uh, somewhere next year. We know any, so, okay, somewhere next, next year. That's what we know about it. Um, the interesting, the major parts, no tiller, because as I mentioned, we don't need it anymore with RBAC on uh, Kubernetes. Um, and, uh, uh, we all hate YAML and Helm tip kind of decided they will do y L Lua instead of YAML and I'm kind of, I I'm not sure about it. Both. Both. So it's horrible YAML and Lua instead of YAML, I'm still not sure about it. Anyway. Huh? Lua is a script, it's not a script, it's a proper programming language mostly used in game dev. It's very weird, I will put it that way. And uh, you can read about it, just Google Helm 3 Lua, and you'll find a discussion about it and why it was selected. I mean, the reasons are valid, the, and the outcome, the decision, I don't know. I don't know what to say about it. We'll probably learn how to deal with it, and maybe we will learn how love Lua. For now, I'm kind of, ah, <laughs> this is weird. Anyways. Let's talk about how we, uh, what are the problems of Helm and how can we solve them? So that's um, my favorite Venn diagram in software engineering. Anyone kind of feel the same about it? There are exceptions, but not a lot really. Uh, so yeah. Um, now out of all the pieces of software engineering which are horrible, dependency managers or package manager are the worst, right? I don't know if uh, you any um, oatmeal fans here 
but what he actually said about printers is 100% correct, but it also completely and entirely applicable for package managers. They're also sent from hell to make it a lot of miserable. Um, one of the people who actually tried was Sam Boer, and he is the guy who wrote GoDep. Anyone knows Go here? Any Go developers? Anyone worked with GoDep? Um, anyone liked GoDep? Yeah. So it's not because Sam Boer has no idea what he's doing. He actually did tons of research and, there were, and not only read uh, academic papers, but also wrote academic papers about dependency manager. But I think this blog post, uh, which is called, so you want to write a package manager. And again, all the links are um, in the jeffrock.com show notes, including to this one, summarizes it pretty well. Right, so you know what? I don't have enough misery and suffering in my life. I know what I'll do. I'll write a language package manager. And package management is awful, so you should quit right now. Package management, nasty domain, really nasty. And here is the most important part. On the surface, it seems like a pro purely technical problem, but it's actually this. People are terrible. That's why package managers suck. Our lives are meaningless perturbations in the swirling vortex of chaos and entropy. That's what you feel when you work with uh, the pack package managers. And um, we in JFrog, we deal with this crap every day for the last decade. And this is what we learned. Um, all the package managers suffer from one or more of the seven deadly sins of package managers. Over architecture, not thinking about enterprise scenarios, Having in downloadable index, we're going to talk about this a little bit more because it requires explanation what's so wrong about it. Cross-site dependency resolution loopholes, not applicable for Helm, but ask me at the booth if you want to know more. Other authentication done wrong, version management or lack of thereof, and using wrong place for central registry and hard coding it. Most of them are not applicable to Helm. Hellman actually very well written and tackled most of the problems, except of those two. Well, I would say over and over architecture uh, when we refer to Tiller, but going back now in hindsight, this is true. Tiller is overcomplicated and we don't need it anymore, but we really don't need it because Kubernetes is involved. Looking back at the time when, Tiller, when Helm was actually written, that was a very neat solution to the problem of lack of airbag and Kubernetes. Now we don't need it, it goes away, everything is good, but those two are, um, are a problem. We're going to talk about both of them. Yeah. And um, let's talk about the enterprise scenarios. So first requirement of any enterprise, and I don't mean it in a bad way, the other way around, I mean it in a good way, uh, when you, you are serious about your software development. And it's not another pet project, it's actually something that you do for a living and people depend on it, that kind of enterprise, the good one. And the, the first problem is you have to have in-house registry. And for having in-house registry, you need user authentication and authorization. And this is something Helm used to lock entirely. If you can access the registry or the repository, you can download everything from it. You can upload whatever you like to it. And it's kind of okay for smaller teams when you have this concept of, uh, you know, of um, freedom and responsibility and you trust your people that you know, you, they know what they are doing. Unless you are Netflix, that's not the case. People have no idea what they're doing. So that was a real big problem. And uh, what the problem is, is that you don't have this org or project or team segmentation inside your repository. So you have your repository, which is organization wide, and then you want to segment them by projects, by organizations, by teams. You cannot do that if you don't have user authentication and authorization, right? And also promotion pipelines that you want to build across your um, repository when you promote your Helm charts from one state to another through quality gates. You go from development to staging to production. The only way to enforce the quality of this pipeline is to make sure that those quality gates are strong enough. 
And that basically means how do you ensure that your production systems cannot by mistake read a Helm chart which is in development repository. And again, we are going back to having authentication and authorization. Your production uh, automation cannot have access to your development, uh, development resources by no means. That's kind of the basic of, uh, of promotion pipelines. And that was actually pretty, pretty easy to solve. We just uh, submitted a pull request um, a while ago in um, what it, it's a, a year ago. Uh, yeah, uh, almost, a, almost a year ago. And after some discussion, um, it was actually uh, merged. And uh, for, for a while now, I would say for like nine months by now, we do have, uh, we can, uh, when we log in into our Helm chart, we, uh, into our Helm repository, we provide username and password. And uh, it was easy to solve because there is really nothing to do in the Helm side as well, uh, at all. All the management of RBAC is on the repository side. So if there is a repository which understands you, um, authentication and authorization, it will make this username and password that we provide to Helm to good use. If we just fired up an HTTP server and, self, uh, and, and, and serve archives out of it, probably we'll just ignore this username and password because we have nothing to do with it. So it was, it was re really easy to solve and it's solved for a while now. The more, the more interesting and the more problematic is the downloadable index. So as I mentioned, uh, we consider having a downloadable index as a downside. And that's because it has some pros, obviously. First of all, very simple server. As you saw, if we calculate our index on the client, the server doesn't have to do anything. It needs just to serve this file to other clients. Another benefit, if we downloaded the index to the client, we can now go offline for searching. We can search a local index without getting to the server. And it's kind of a pro, but I'm not sure how useful it is because when you found what you want, what do you want to do next? You want to download it, but, and then you need to be online. So it's kind of a weird pro. And the real, the real reason why the downloadable index was in, in first invented is to offload the search of the server to spare computer power. Because what happens now, if you have downloadable index, you download your index, you do, how many of you are familiar with Debian or RPM? Okay, yeah, most of you. So you do what, like get, um, apt, um, apt get uh, update, right? It downloads the index, and then you do apt get search. It searches the local index, and then you do apt get install, and you install from the server. The search is performed on a local index file that you just downloaded. Helm is exactly the same. You download an index, and then you search on it locally. And that spares the server of thousands, millions, billions of people simultaneously doing searches on your server and requires a huge computer power. Obviously, when Debian and, uh, and um, RPM were invented in the, what, 70s, that made a lot of sense. But we are not there now. Server computer power, it's not an issue anymore. Not especially for, I would say, kind of a niche thing like a Helm server. So this saving computer power is not really a good excuse. Now the cons are, first of all, you cannot search for latest stuff before you actually download an index, which is kind of silly. And index becomes a bottleneck, especially when it's done wrong, because now everybody need to update the same index, download the same index, and having this index file is a problem of its own. So how do we know if it is a problem? We run some benchmarks, and 
we run benchmarks of an index of 120,000 charts. And this is where all of you should go like, what? 120,000 charts, who has that many? And the answer to that goes to, remember this guy who was not sure if we have less charts than tags of Docker images? Remember that? Now, the problem is you can reuse the same charts for different image tags. That's what we were saying because of the templating and you can replace. But the question is, what will be in the values.yaml? What do you put there? Latest, right? And that's okay. But then every time you run, you have to specify a different tag because you don't want to run latest, right? So you need to say, okay, I want to run this Helm chart, but I want to override the value of image tag with 1.1. And you need to do it every time you run it. And of course you say, well, but I never run it locally. I actually have a script that runs it, which brings me back, okay, what do you put in the script? And then you can say, well, I'll put a variable there and use a templating engine, and we are back to the same discussion again. Right? So generally you will want to have the value files changed every time you release a new Docker image of any of the images which are part of your chart. And that basically means that you have a Cartesian product of charts from all the tags of all the images in the charts. And that's a lot of charts. And this is why this number of 100 and, um, 120,000 that we came up with is not something unheard of especially for, I would say, medium organizations, not mentioning uh, large ones. So this is what happens when we run, and you can see here number of charts, and this is our 120, and this will be a memory consumption. And it actually blows uh, everything out of the water. It's like you can see here, it's a graph that spins upward and it's a problem. Now, first of all, we need to understand how the, this index is created, how it's transferred from, from the server to the client and what's versa, and what can we do with it. So first, the easiest option is we can save some bandwidth by gzipping the index in transit. And that will help a little bit. It will, help, it will have the bandwidth and the latency, and obviously the files will be smaller and will be transitioned easily, but it doesn't really solve the memory consumption problem. What we actually saw, and I don't have it in slides, is that what Helm does is YAML on the client side, YAML on the server side, but when it analyzes the index, it actually creates JSON out of it works in a JSON model and then dumps it back as YAML. So the first, and well, we cannot blame them who wants to work with YAML, but maybe still this double converting is not the best idea. The other solution, which actually is very important because it, it is actually scalable, is distributing the index. This is how the index looks now in this index YAML file of Helm. And that's an example of Artifactory, old one, but it doesn't really matter. So what you can see here is that in this index, we have an entry pair up, and then we have a bunch of metadata about it, when it was created, the description, the home page, the icon, the keywords, the maintainers, name sources, etc., etc. That's kind of a metadata on the level of the app. And then we have a version, an entry per version. Which versions do we have with additional metadata about the particular version, right? So here we have 583, which was created somewhere. And then we have this exactly the same one, 562, created in another time, 
But all the rest here, description and below, is an absolute duplicate of this one. And we have the same entry, the entire block of metadata, for each and every version. That's true that the description might change between the versions, but in the most cases, it will be the exact duplicate, which is kind of silly and blows up, obviously, the, uh, the index and also slows down the computation of the index and increases the memory needed for parsing this repetitive uh, objects over and over again. So if we can divide this index into smaller parts, first, we won't need to calculate it all in once, we won't need to download it in all in once, and we won't need to parse it all in once. So what actually makes sense is having the main index, which will have a list of apps and the latest version. So when you search, does Artifactory even exist? it will find and show the latest version. So we'll have entries like this, one for Factory, one for X-ray, one for whatever it is. And then the app index, which is a separate file, and it contains the list of versions and an up-level metadata, the descriptor, the maintainers, the home, and everything else. So we will have an index, which is a list of all the apps, and per app, we will have another index with the versions and the metadata, and then a version index, which will describe this particular version. What is the version, when it was created, the digest, the, the SHA-2, and the URL where to download it from, right? So this is structured index broken up in smaller files, and the problem is that it, now the repository cannot be just a root with a bunch of zips, because now you have a structure to put the indexes in the right places. So you will actually need a layout. So you will have a repo, and the index file, the big one with the list of all the apps, will be on the repo, in, uh, on the repo level. And then you have an app, and the app index file with the list of all the versions will be here. And then you have the versions, and each and every directory in the version will have this tiny, tiny index of the version, the descriptor of the version itself. And the problem with it, that it complicates the push, the addition of additional Helm charts. Because what we used to do now, we just build the Helm archive, drop it in the root of the repository. We don't need anything. We just do like curl upload or, or whatever, and we are done. But now, we actually need to know where to put those archives inside a tree. It won't go to the root. Instead, a new version of our app will have to go here. And the example of this is, again, um, debs. When you know deb doesn't have a push command or an upload command, you actually use curl to upload Debian packages, but you need to know how to structure the path or where to put this file. It's not obvious, and you actually need this knowledge that you don't really need, that you expect a tool to encapsulate for you. And there is a lot of discussion about push. Um, there is like a spec of uh, what it can, what, what it should do, how, where it should build, and actually introducing a push allows us to build those changes into the layout, into the roadmap without breaking clients. When we say to them, you don't want to know what the repository looks like. You shouldn't care about the layout. Just use Helm install. We will know how to get the charts from the right place and do Helm push, and we will know where to put them. Today, we know how to download from the root of the repository and push to the root of the repository. Tomorrow, we will know how to download from this complicated layout and push to whatever right place it is. So encapsulating, as usual in computer science, encapsulating is a good thing, and push allows us to do that. So that's kind of another uh, important part of it. And it's actually also on the roadmap of Helm 3. So another important, uh, for us at least, another important 
uh, improvement in Helm tree on top of getting rid of uh, Tiller and introducing a programming language for templating agent is the ability to push, which will in turn encapsulate the layout and allow us to evolve it to be a more robust one that won't kill your client and your server when you actually helm a lot of a lot of charms. So with that, just to remind you, um, that's me, that's Velocity, that's Helm, and that's the show notes that have all the links for you over there. And now we have six minutes for questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions? Yes. Yeah, so that's a great question. Graphics integration with X-Ray. It has nothing to do with the talk, but I will more than happy to talk to you about that. Probably in the booth will be more kind of appropriate. Just for the rest of you, Graphias is an open source initiative by Google, JFrog, and others to provide a standardized metadata across all the tools for managing binaries. Um, it will obviously allow collaboration between the tools when we can ask um, national vulnerabilities database about a certain artifact in a unified format and get a reply for them about the vulnerabilities in this artifact again in a unified format. And then our deployment tools can use the same format to ask our internal repositories and tools if we have any problems with artifacts or just general metadata and get the unified format back. That's a fascinating topic. I will be more than happy to talk to you about that in our booth. And you will get a t-shirt. Yes. Thanks for the talk. Uh, so it's not a topic that we've covered, but it is related to scalability itself. So in a microservice environment, if you have an organization that's handling all different services, what is the uh, good structure of Helm Charm? Do you recommend that a single Helm Charm that is um, managing all of these different services? Yeah, so that's a great question. And the question was, um, if you have a big organization, what will be the reasonable structure of Helm repositories in this organization? Should we have one repository for all of them or not? And that obviously has to do a lot with scalability. So generally, it's a, it's a good question for any kind of repository, not necessarily Helm. How do you structure your Docker registries in a big organization? How do you structure your Maven repositories, uh, God forbid, in, in a large organization? Whatever tools you have, you have registries, repositories, how do you build that? Now, um, you know what the difference between good question and great question? The good question is the one that I know the answer. The great question is the one that I have a slide for. Now, this is, I don't know, like outstanding question because we have a white paper about it. So if you go to jeffrock.com, there is a white paper about structuring repositories. It applies to any type of them, including Helm. Generally, there are two different separation types that you want to apply. The first and the most important one is by pipeline steps through your quality gates. It's very important to have separate repositories for your development, your QA, your staging, your production, whatever your pipeline looks like, because this is how you establish a very strong quality gates. Well, with authentication, authorization, what I mentioned, your production uh, runtimes shouldn't have access to anything except of your production repository, because this is how you guarantee that only those artifacts which promote it through all the quality gates are actually will be used in production. So that's one kind of separation. The other is a little bit more um, depend on the situation or change the cross organizations. You may have um, repositories per teams, per project, or you can actually have a one repository for an entire organization. That's completely up to you. The most important separation is by quality gate. The rest is up to you. The good news about having multiple repositories 
sorry, is that it won't hurt your performance or storage or whatever. As long as you use one repository manager like Artifactory, it will deduplicate the files on a storage level anyhow. So you can have the same repo chart in each and every repository in your pipeline. It will eventually save it only once. So that's not, that's not a problem. So you, you can have, you shouldn't be afraid creating multiple repositories per teams, basically based on your RBAC, on your roles in the organization and who should have access to what. Usually third party, you will have one for everybody because you want everybody to use it. And the artifact that you produce, you might want to segregate because you don't want to overwhelm, overwhelm the organization with the artifact that they will never need. This kind of stuff. Does it make sense? Yeah. All right. One more. No? Yeah. So do you guys use this Cobra Stage process in your internal systems? Yeah. Absolutely, thank you for the question. And the question was, first, do we use Helm in production for our products in, in JFrog? And the second is, if nothing changed uh, except of a Docker image tag, do we create a new Helm chart? So the answer is yes and yes. Uh, we do use uh, Helm heavily in our production systems, both for our cloud deployments, and we have, we have a hybrid um, um, offering which allows you to both use our tools on-prem or consume them as a service on the cloud. So we use Helm in both. In the cloud, we provision our own software with Helm and um, one of our uh, distribution types that you can consume our software on-prem is just download the Helm chart and use Software Artifactory in this central Cubeops repository, you just go there and you do like Helm install Artifactory and it actually installs. So obviously we produce Helm charts as well. And for the second question, um, we spoke about that as well. Since we don't want people to have mentioning the version every time they want to start up, for example, Artifactory as a Helm chart, we have to produce a new Helm chart for every new version of our, any of our images which are part of this Helm chart. We don't have any other option. And so, your software changes in the software, you've got a version on your Helm chart. How do you differentiate between a, a major version and a minor version change? Is that something you have to sort of manually? So, so there is no correlation between, no similarity between the chart version and the Docker images. Just because um, chart versions increment more frequently because they reflect changes in all the tags which are part of the change, uh, of, the, of the tag. So they, they, they are not as they are the same version. They have new ones every, every time. And the metadata that we have in Artifactory, stuff like our build integration, that again, if you are interested, uh, come to the booth to talk about it, we can correlate between the two we can very easily see that, okay, this Helm chart have this Docker image, and this Docker image have actually this version of Artifactory War inside it, and that's all is actually very easy to see in, in Artifactory, so that's not an issue, not an issue for us. And this gentleman, you had one question. We are out of time, but let's see if we can do it shortly. So the question is, do we as JFrog use Helm in CI CD pipeline or manually? And the answer is both. Uh, all our build is completely automated. We do generate and consume Helm charts completely automatic. When we deploy it to our cloud, we actually deploy it automatically. And when you want to play with Artifactory, you will probably install it manually. But then when you automate your data center to get upgrades of Artifactory, uh, you know, every time they're released, you will obviously automate that as well. So with that, if you have additional uh, questions, you know where to find me, when to find Rimas, we're at our booth. Come to talk to us. Thank you very much, and bye-bye.